Last year, um, we uh, had, had been in discussions with, with FarmWorks and uh, also um, come across this theme in our own work. Um, Jamie does work on, on uh, the legal aspect of, um, of food policy. And uh, like I said, I, I uh, deal with agriculture in my work on rural economic development. Um, and we'd been repeatedly bumping up, this, bumping up against this theme of um, people's frustrations with um, regulations. And uh, so um, we decided to do um, a set of interviews uh, with food producers, um, food entrepreneurs in Nova Scotia about their experiences with um, regulation. And uh, the background for this is that um, we know that regulatory regimes around food are getting increasingly complex. Um, and the people that are left to navigate them are, are often people who are like in the throes of starting their own business. Often they lack uh, access to capital. Um, they might lack access to the, the um, professional or technical knowledge that they need to, to figure out the regulations that are in front of them. Um, and so increasingly regulations are viewed as a, um, as a burden. Um, even though people largely, um, you know, in, in our study and other studies, believe in the need for regulation um, and believe that it's very important that we ensure that food is safe and, and uh, that it's plentiful. Um, but they find themselves uh, trapped in, um, you know, what colloquially we'd call red tape. So our study um, was to look at uh, food businesses' experiences with regulation. So it was really about um, how do people understand what's happening to them uh, when they have to navigate um, regulations around food production. Um, what are the consequences uh, of those experiences and encounters? And um, what are the response strategies that people have? So what do they do when they find themselves up against um, a set of regulations that they don't understand or can't meet or are you know, being told conflicting things about. Um, and uh, the study is small. Um, you know, it's, we only had uh, 10 interviews. We sought a lot more, but um, we understand that people are just uh, totally fatigued by research and everything else going on in our lives right now. So it's kind of common across studies. Um, in any case, what we found we think is important for starting a conversation about um, regulations uh, around food. So uh, in Nova Scotia, so we did a set of semi-structured interviews. So we had a, a question guide and we talked to, like I said, 10 uh, food and agricultural business owner operators in Nova Scotia. Um, we recruited them via um, the, the email list from FarmWorks uh, Investment Cooperative. Um, so that was circulated by email. We also uh, posted on social media. And uh, once we got people, we asked about uh, their regulatory and legal problems and responses. Um, and we also talked to them about the supports available to them um, from public and private sources. Um, so again, we aimed for 30 people at least. We did not get that, but we still got very um, rich, detailed data. Um, and it aligns with um, the anecdotal stories that we were hearing um, that prompted us to do the the research. So more research to do. Um, and uh, again, it, this is really just about people's experiences and interpretations and their responses and not so much about what the regulations are and, you know, what's right or wrong in that regard. Um, so I'll just speak to a few themes that came up in the interviews. The first theme, um, after we analyzed all of the data, was uh, of uh, unrealistic, unaffordable, or self-serving enforcement. So um, we found that the owner operators that we interviewed make good faith efforts to meet regulations. Um, uh, they want to do it right, um, but often the solutions are expensive or uh, out of reach for other reasons. Um, and uh, food businesses bear the brunt of barriers to compliance, especially if they have any kind of like public facing aspect. So they've got like an intersection of um, building code and food safety and um, all, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, they, they often described like an overly structured and inflexible regulatory environment. So where um, there were like common sense solutions that would keep people safe and meet the objectives, but that were not available to them. Um, I'm not going to get into the specific policies that people mentioned uh, because I'm not an expert in them and hopefully uh, 
I, I don't want to have to answer questions I don't know the answer to. Um, so uh, an example of what people felt was unrealistic, um, one person who, um, this is a person who makes like prepared food, noted that they, they were told they had to put uh, chemicals in a locker um, uh, and they have to put a lock on it. There's documentation of six pages that they have to go through and sign every week to make sure that the chemicals are locked. Uh, the grass outside their business can't be growing uh, higher than an inch. Um, if the grass grows too much, there will be insects coming inside. Um, and so they've got all these little points that they just can't ignore that, you know, on surface sounds kind of ridiculous. Um, a second theme is that people felt that there's an uneven regulatory playing field. So um, they, the people we interviewed felt that importers, big local producers, and established businesses, like people who might be grandfathered in under old regimes, um, are, uh, are, are just playing on a different field than new small businesses. Um, and uh, they, they also felt that when the justification for regulations um, is unclear, um, it makes them seem arbitrary and unfair and, and uh, people can't understand um, why they have to, to follow certain ones. Um, let's see if I have an example of this one. Um, so one, one person pointed to like an old boys club in certain um, fields uh, where um, there are just two sets of, of rules, at least um, in the perception of this interviewee. Um, another theme that came up repeatedly was that um, inspectors uh, sometimes act as obstacles. Um, and, and this one really stuck out to me because it's kind of a, um, an inter... Um, well, it's very social. It's that... Um, uh, inspectors don't necessarily comport themselves um, like actors in a food system who are trying to support the the creation um, and and uh, and to sustain a robust local food system. Um, they they uh, there's an antagonistic relationship between businesses and inspectors um, that I think. You know, th there's of course some examples of like um, particularly irritating people, um, but there's there's also just like a general um, sense that the way things are structured makes it so that businesses are antagonistic with inspectors. Um, when really, if you step back and look at it, they should be cooperating toward a, a sustainable food system. So some of the specific things people pointed to were um, that some inspectors interpret regulations differently, so you might get conflicting advice from different ones. Um, there's poor communication, whether it's just like a really slow response time or unclear explanations of things. Um, there's uneven application of regulation, so people can walk into other businesses and see that they're not doing what they're supposed to, but they were held to the, the standard by their inspector. Um, and uh, um, and you know at the at the very bad end of things, people had the impression that some inspectors had sort of a hero complex um, in in their work. Uh, you know, kind of going around and acting like having the grass at one inch was going to you know save the entire province. Um, and so uh, you know, I, I'm just sort of the messenger here reporting on what people said. But there's obviously a, a negative relationship between a lot of businesses and their inspectors, and it's to me anyway, it's structural. Um, and so, like I said, this, this one is important because it's just the opposite of how a system should work. The parts should be working together. Um, checks and balances don't have to be adversarial. Um, so one, one interviewee noted that they had an inspector who um, came around to their facilities. They'd been operating under previously inspected complete safe zero incidence conditions for nine years, and this inspector made a big giant list of all sorts of deficiencies forced us to change um, change things, even painting the threads on a galvanized gas pipeline that has been on the side of my building for nine years. We're out with paintbrushes in November, you know, to touch up threads that he thought might one day rust through. Um, so it's that kind of pile up of things that people experience as just you know, needlessly um, irritating. Uh, the fourth theme um, that we came up with in our interviews is of poor co communication and coordination. Um, so like I said earlier, Food businesses in particular deal with a bunch of intersecting regulatory um, regimes, and sometimes they conflict, um, or sometimes like people had experiences of being bounced back and forth between different offices where nobody really knew the answer to their question or what, what they were supposed to be doing. Um, 
and uh, like the Department of Environment came up in that regard um, uh, a couple times. Um, and then there's all you know, interpersonal conflicts, which you know that's just the world; it'll happen. Um, but also slow response times um, uh, and uh, like one person had examples of being told to follow regulations that didn't exist, so they were told to do something. They went and looked it up, and it just wasn't in the um, in the Safe Food for Canadians Act that they were supposed to be following. Um, so uh, this report is available, I should say. Um, uh, I don't have the web address, but if anyone wants to e email me or talk to me after the conference, I can. Um, give you a copy of it, uh, because there's a lot more detail in there. Um, but uh, a summary of the findings is that um, there there is a need for change. Um, and uh, we also need to add um, to this specific focus all of the bigger intersecting issues that are going on in the background. So access to, to capital is one of the big things that came up again and again, that um, small businesses uh, you know, in, in less, um, unless they had money to begin with, um, they're really, really struggling at the outset. And um, this, uh, when you're dealing with some regulations, um, they're expensive to meet, and they're also just uh, a lot to deal with on top of everything else when you're trying to start a business. Um, and it, related to this, um, people also reported issues with, with government funding. So they said, um, uh, and this happens in, in my world too, in academia, you always have to find matching funds. So it's, if you want to unlock $10,000, you have to already have $10,000 to match it. Um, and that's not achievable for some businesses. Um, and sometimes the requirements to access funding are too specific. Like, um, you know, you, you can only access it to install a particular type of thing that not every business needs. Um, and, uh, and also that some uh, funding pots are just too big for small businesses. So they expect that you're going to be a big, you know, export oriented kind of um, operation. And if you're not, you can't get that, that funding. Um, like some people said, you know, I don't need $200,000. I need $25,000. And there is no um, small pot of funding um, uh, available. Um, another intersecting issue is infrastructure which I think we'll, we'll get to more um, with my colleagues here. Um, so uh, a, a lack of abattoirs and a lack of commercial kitchen space that meets um, CFIA or GFSI standards. So that means that people are trying to do it themselves or they're spending a lot of money um, traipsing all over the place trying to get uh, animals processed or what have you. Um, and another intersecting issue is uh, labor, labor shortages. Um, so sometimes to meet specific kinds of regulations, especially if they have to do with uh, technology or paperwork, you need a different skill set than the people that you're hiring to produce um, food. And uh, so people reported that as an issue. I already mentioned that a lot of programs um, are biased toward ex export-led growth. Um, so there's this view that if you are a serious business, you're going to grow rapidly and um, focus on exporting. Um, I'm supposed to talk about the uh, people's response strategies, but um, maybe that'll come out in the questions because I am running out of time. Um, just try to wrap it up here. I think um, in the report, we got some ideas for, for change. People have ideas for um, for how to change things, and I think it starts with um, a real an examination of the regulatory regimes affecting food that involves um, people who actually do food production um, to kind of identify where things can change, um, where some things might be streamlined, or where there might be some flexibility that currently there isn't. Um, thank you. I'll stop now. Thanks so much, Karen. I'm just going to stop my alarm here. So we have room, we have time for two questions. Anybody have a question for Karen? Go ahead, please. Um, it's not really a question. I would just validate like my experiences at the farmers market really echo what you're saying. And I'd say there's a definitely a culture of fear with the vendors around the new food inspector and when they come and depending on which county you're in and which inspector you get, you know, so and so is easy. So just interesting to hear that validated in, in your, your study. 
Yeah, I mean, to, to me, if that one stood out, and I think it's like, it, that happens in all uh, industries that get inspected, right? So it's like, I think there's, there's, a, there's a culture around inspection that makes it that way. Um, you know, even in, in buildings, like you think you'd want, um, you think you'd want an inspector to come and make things safer and make sure you're doing it all right, but people try to skirt around it because it's usually antagonistic. Yeah. And very costly. And, and yeah, and costly. Okay, so do we have a second question for Karen before we move on to Michael? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands, so I think that... Um, <laughs> there's a, there's oh, there's one behind you. Hey there. Just wondering, um, you mentioned that the relationship is antagonistic. Why do you think it's antagonistic from talking to the uh, businesses that you talk to? Um, I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of explanations. Um, the businesses themselves, one explanation was that they felt like inspectors often don't um, like there, there was a time in the past when inspectors might have had a food production or farming background themselves, um, and now they feel like they don't have that um, knowledge necessarily. Um, I, I don't know what other explanation there is except maybe cultural, right? Like that's, at some point that tone is being set. Um, and I think it's that, you know, um, what, what uh, the other audience member said, you know, that people are, if, if you're afraid that someone showing up is going to cost you money or make you stop doing business, um, that's not really a good uh, place to start with any kind of relationship. But I think overall, I think it needs, there's got to be more research. Thank you, Karen. That was really fascinating, and certainly it validates a whole ton of the work I've done in regulation in, in rural BC. So now we're going to move over to Michael Eisner, who um, is one of the fabulous founders of Northumberland um, Lamb Co-op, and he's going to um, make what Karen has just talked about very real, I think. So go, go ahead, Michael. Um, okay. I can't read this with my glasses on. Uh, yeah, my name's Michael Eisner. I've... Um, I managed Northumberland Marketing Co-op Limited for 40 years, um, but I'm recently retired. Last fall, I retired. So, but they still insisted that I come to this. So I'll do. <laughs> I'll try to uh, answer the questions that you might have. Um, okay, I started out um, 40 some years ago as a small farmer wanting to um, make a living, back to the land, you know, much like it is right now. I wanted to go live on the land, see if I can make a living raising a few sheep, you know, throw away the TV, <laughs> you, know the, you know the song. And, uh, and well, you, I used to like to meet with other like-minded small farmers. We're all small farmers, and we get together, and that's how I learned how to raise sheep, and that's, uh, we, 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 we all had the same kind of problems with marketing. And uh, I, I best better read here because I don't know where I'm going. Uh, some of the farmers that had trouble with marketing, they didn't live close enough to the markets, so they couldn't access the uh, the main markets and to get better prices. Uh, there was no processors available for them, and they didn't enjoy the time it took to market. Um, Abra, I don't know if any of you heard her speak earlier about Kathleen Neen, but uh, I, I Brewster Neen her husband and Kathleen Neen, they were small-time sheep farmers at the same time. Brewster was really, at heart, a community organizer. And so he organized a lot of sheep farmers around the countryside that wanted to work together. And uh, that's how we got started. Uh, they, they had a sheep farm in Salt Springs, and uh, Northumberland Lamb Marketing uh, Association was started up again at that time. And out of that, we came up with the idea of forming a co-op to uh, market our lambs. And I was asked to be the, uh, the manager of that co-op, which I did for 40 years. Uh, and we, so there was a lot of changes over those times, as you can imagine. We started out, talk about regulations. In the beginning, um, I was delivering lambs in the back of a, a insulated, uh, back of a pickup truck, and the lambs were in an insulated box. And we went from that to federal inspection. So there was a, quite, a, quite a few changes we went through over the years. Um, so 
So it was it's very important, like by forming a co-op, one farmer couldn't actually access any markets. Like you couldn't sell to a, a, a grocery store, or you, you you would have to individually sell to your neighbor or to farmers markets, but you couldn't really get into any kind of consistent marketing. But together as a co-op, we were able to have enough supply and people were producing lambs over the year that we could start working with uh, the grocery stores. And we were lucky to have Sobeys at that time, 40 some years ago, and they were a local store then, and they wanted to buy our product. And they wanted to have fresh Nova Scotia lamb in the stores. So that worked out pretty well. So we were, like I said, started out me delivering lambs in the back of my pickup truck. And uh, so we started with Sobeys. But there was also other grocery stores at that time. There was Dominion, IGA, Save Easy, super, not, not Superstore, um, Capital Stores and that. So after a year or two, we actually had been able to get a supply going, a year-round supply, top quality. And... Uh, and the lamb product, our lamb was in demand. So we went from, we went from there to, uh, oh boy. I'm gonna put this down. <laughs> so we w so because we were a co-op, a group of farmers working together, we were able to, um, do things that one person couldn't do, like I started to say. And eventually we bought a small abattoir, a provincially operated abattoir. Now that, that was actually within the first five years. That was a big challenge. We almost lost it. We pretty well went, just about went bankrupt the first year. But we recovered from that. And, uh, and that's a whole lot of stories involved in all that. But uh, we got better and better at what we were doing. And uh, we started to make a little bit of money. We were able to expand our market, and and uh, but as we were as we were going, so were the, the everything else was going, and they Sobeys and the other stores start, started having distribution centers. In the beginning, there was no such thing as a distribution center, but um, as so with their distribution center, it became necessary to have federal inspection. We were able to work around that for a while. We were able to still deliver directly to the stores, but eventually we knew that we were going to be pushed out of the market if we didn't get federal inspection. But that's, that was right out of there. It didn't seem like that was a possibility at all because of the cost, the money. And I kept saying, we can't do that. We just, I, we just can't do that. But then uh, this about, I think it was 2011, the federal government brought up this pilot project called the Federal Provincial um, Pilot Project to take provincial plants up to federal inspection or to be able to sell in, fe in federally. So we said, well, that sounds like what we're looking for. So we applied for that. Um, I think there were 67 plants across the, the whole country that applied for that. And uh, we were one of the ones that got accepted in it. And this, it was a three-way split we had to come up with one third of the money, which was a lot of money for us at that time. It was, I can't really remember, but I think it was like between two and three hundred thousand dollars our share, which I can't even remember how we came up with that. I guess we thought we could mortgage the plant and uh, go from there. But that project turned out that uh, after it got going, the Fed said, no, there's no way you can, you can't have another system. It can't be federal, it can't be provincial, and then it can't be a system that can sell into the federal. It either You're going to have to go totally federal. Again, we thought, well, there's no way we can do that, but um, we, we persevered because all our money was tied up in it already, so we had to go on, we had to carry on with it. And that was a big, big challenge, uh, um, a huge challenge. If we had known what we were getting into, I don't think we would have did it. But... Um, we had Perinia that uh, really helped us, guide us through the whole process. And I could, I understand what uh, Karen, right? <laughs> what she was saying about some of the, like the short grass. I remember we were hearing some about these regulations. We thought, there's no way that we can do this stuff. It's just impossible. All the, uh, all, every way, everything from the barn through. I mean, it just didn't seem at all possible. But we kept on persevering, going through, and then eventually we ran out of money, but the provincial government put in some more money to help us out. So we got 
finally through to the end and we became federally inspected in uh, 2015 and right away Sobeys was taking our lamb, at, not right away, but within a year they were taking our lamb at, in their distribution center and, and we've been doing that ever since. It's made a huge difference. But I have to say the whole regulation really surprised me because it seemed like these regulations were too onerous that we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do them. It, the the day-to-day -day operations would be too burdensome. But in, in actual fact, it turned out really that they were helpful because they provided a whole lot of standard, they call it standard operation procedures that really helped us because we, we, you know, we had something we had to do. We had to do this all the time. So you didn't get behind. You didn't run into trouble. You didn't have issues with things getting unsightly or getting into a health problem because you had to do these things every day. And it had, it, the system really was actually turned out to be very helpful. And then with that, it made us be able to continue on and, and, and do more. And um, our product continued to improve. And that's basically where we're at now. I mean, uh, we're still hoping to, the, as the farmers would like to produce more lambs, so it's always this challenge between when the lamb supply is there, can you sell them quick enough? Can you get your market to match your supply? But then maybe that supply won't be there all year round. And we have to, when you're dealing with like the grocery chains, you have to have a steady, consistent supply. You can't say, oh, we don't have any this week. You, you have to have it every week. And that, that is always the biggest problem. But we, we continue to work on that and, uh, and, um, and we're continuing on. So, um, yeah, I, I guess basically if there's, that's basically where we are right now. So I'm retired, it's somebody else's job, but they're still hoping to expand and carry on. So um, I, if any questions, we'll... I'm take, ready to take them. Thank you, Michael. Does anyone have any questions, comments? Is this on? Yes. Um, I was just wondering the cost of two hundred thousand dollars. That was like one third of just the inspection, or what was involved in the cost? Uh, well, the, no, uh, we had to really upgrade the facilities a lot more than we thought we would. I mean. Um, from basically we replaced our floors, we replaced our walls, we replaced the, uh, all the, the refrigeration doors, the, uh, all the handling facilities, the barn had to be re, uh, uh, the loading facilities. So there, was, there was a lot of infrastructure. It, it's not like, and one of the problems with getting, the, the, with the federal inspection is not, there's no, nobody will tell you up front what you have to do. You can't get, there's no one, say, you can't get to say, okay, tell us what we need and we'll go see if we can do it. It's not like that. They say, this is the outcomes we expect. You have to be able to do these in the end of the day. Any way that you can come up with doing that, as long as you meet the outcomes, we'll be okay. But as you, so meeting those outcomes sometimes can be very, very tricky. But once you have the facilities, it actually is better. But I mean, you do, funding is a major problem. But really the biggest problem now more is not so much the regulations, that's actually a help because we can go, you can go to Sobeys, you can go to Costco, you can go any of these ones and first question is are you federally inspected? And the answer is yes, so you've got a great step forward. But then the marketing, you know, it, just because you're federally inspected doesn't mean that they're gonna buy what you have and if everybody wants just racks of lambs, you have to, you have to build a market all the rest of the stuff so you still have all that all that logistic problems, and really the marketing is probably a bigger headache than the, uh, the it definitely is a bigger headache than the, uh, than the regulations. Thank you, Michael. Any other questions? I think we've got one from Josh. Yeah. Go ahead, Josh. Or, okay. okay. Oh, Thank sorry. you. Uh, I'm just curious, because you've, you've had the, you know, it's a great experiment. Uh, so to speak, of being both a provincially certified plant and now a federally certified plant. And it might be just, you know, a sample size of one, but did you have any sort of callbacks or health and safety issues that going to federal magically solved? Or do you feel like some of the steps that were taken are potential redundancies that aren't necessarily making things any better than, than provincial? 
I, we definitely thought that before we started. But uh, no, I, 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 most of the regulations, I, I see that they're, they're beneficial. They're, um, they're, they really actually do help as, as a producer. They help a producer as well. And um, we didn't have any recalls. But if you, I mean, you have to have all the systems in place that if there is a recall, you have to be able to pull back your product. That I mean, you think, well, how can we do that? How could you possibly do that? We've sent all these cut up lamb to all these different places, but you create the systems. That's the hardest part, creating the systems. But you create these systems, and you and you have to test them once a year. That you know you can, if there's a recall on this, how how are you going to get it? How do you get it back? I mean, it is onerous getting it started, getting all that set up. But once it's there, it's it's actually a lot better. So I'm afraid I'm going to cut it off there. We will have hopefully some time at the very end for more questions and answer. But I, the one thing I'd really like to flag in what Michael said is we're talking about animals. We're talking about species that tend to gestate in a particular cycle. So the fact that Northumberland uh, Lamb Co-op has figured out how to support farmers to not only produce a high quality product, but to have those gestation cycles work so that they can have lamb year round is an extraordinary feat. And I, anytime I'm in this province, I'm eating lamb because I think that's such an amazing story and such a critical um, support for sheep farmers across this province. So I'm really grateful you came today, Michael. Thank you. So now we'll turn over to Hannah Nelson, who's going to flip us over to fish. Hi, Hannah Nelson. Um, my company is Aficionado Fishmongers, and we started in, in 2014. Um, and actually, since we've started, I kind of wear another hat. So um, my husband also is an oyster farmer, so Shandaff Oysters, and we run that on Big Island on the north shore of Nova Scotia. So I'll talk a little bit about my experience and, and transition a little bit to talk about shellfish aquaculture in, in, in Nova Scotia and the regulatory challenges there. But we'll start in some of the successes that, that our story has had has been because we've started pretty small scale and always collaborating with other um, businesses. When, when we started, I wanted to, you know, I had this feeling that things were changing in Halifax and people wanted access to our own seafood and we wanted access to seafood from from producers and, and fishers that fished in a way that, you know, was transparent and that we we supported that, you know, tried to minimize minimize effects on the ecological ecosystems or from aquaculture operations that that were clear about about their practices. So I bought a little fish stand, it was like $2,000, maybe it was $2,500. Um, actually at that time, I think the year I started was the year they, the provincial government stopped, but there was a tax rebate if you had just graduated university and stayed in Nova Scotia for the, for the next two years or whatever. So actually that fish table was paid for by that grant, I think, in, or by the grant, by the tax rebate. I think in total it was like $4,000. And that's what helped start, start the business and was actually a really great program. Um, so I just rented small like 20 square feet from this local green grocer who also wanted seafood in, in their space. Um, and I did that for a year and always the intention was that we were gonna open um, our own bricks and mortar seafood shop. And through that first process that year, I realized a couple things. One is yes, people wanted more transparent access to seafood, but two, we don't eat a lot of seafood in Nova Scotia, and we're not a high density city. The Halifax Peninsula is still like 90,000 people. And you know, we're recommended to eat seafood once a week. Most people don't eat seafood once a week. So imagine how much you know, economic dollars you're putting towards seafood. It's actually not that much. The other challenge we face is, you know, there's a story of a story of, you know, my cousin or my, this friend of a friend is a fisherman and we buy directly from them and it's like $2 a pound, which very often doesn't happen. People talk about how inexpensive it is to buy directly from the fisherman, but they also don't actually do that. Um, so you find there's price sensitivity certainly around, around our seafood. And 
something that hasn't helped that is export markets are very strong and there's other regions of the world who are paying more than, than we are. And, and this is a challenge because how can you give back the highest return to your producers and also feed locals? Sometimes it's, it's incompatible um, because other places are, are, are paying so much for it and that, that's, a consistent, that's a consistent challenge. So in, in trying to decide, I mean, I remember being in a space that we were going to rent and I realized how much money you would have to do in sales to be able to make a living. And I realized I'm going to be a small shop owner for the rest of my life and never leave here if this is what I choose to do. Um, there's got to be a different, different way. Um, and seafood is always, we're very far behind. I think there's an important cultural aspect of seafood that we need to reckon with in terms of, you know, seafood pr producers aren't usually part of these conversations. We're not part of local food systems. We're kind of always on the, on the other side or the fringes. And I think there's cultural reasons for that. Fishing is a activity you partake by yourself. Um, you hear, you know, the salt water runs through my blood and there's a distance um, in their, those activities to also being part of community that makes it so sometimes it's, it's, it's really difficult to, to crack that nut and that lifestyle to bring some of these stories um, to, the, to the front so things happen how they've always happened. Um, you know, seafood producers, other than the act of actually catching the fish or farming, the product outsource everything else, so you don't often get these stories. And that was something for for me that I realized was very important in the seafood world. And sometimes I think the local food communities or or, or communities haven't grappled with seafood because we still expect that the only true relationship should be directly with that fisher or with that with that um, farmer of shellfish or finfish or whatever it is that that they're farming and that doesn't work very well in seafood because the amount of seafood that you're catching is so great and you have such a small amount of time to treat it properly and utilize it. So there's actually a supply chain that is important in seafood where that's direct marketing, I don't know if is always appropriate. I actually don't know that we've figured out very good systems yet for how to, to treat seafood producers in this whole supply chain because we've seen it go totally the other way in, in your neck of the woods in, in BC with um, you know the vertical integration where one company basically owns everything because of some of these challenges with, with, with seafood. Even you have fleet separation, well there's just not that many you know lobster co-ops in Nova Scotia that are selling their own product. It's, it's, it's a very dis... Um, Everyone kind of works in their in their in their different pockets. And um, one thing for for us when I started that I realized was important was being somebody in the middle who did value being able to make the seafood available to locals. But but to make it available to locals, and and this is the next step of our story. We actually went federally regulated in 2016. You you had to do it on the backs of your export markets. Um, to, to be able to have the seafood that we valued, you had to be prepared to buy a fisherman's entire catch. And this is thousands of pounds of seafood. Um, one of our, we've had a great relationship with Sustainable Blue, they're a land-based um, salmon farm in the valley. Um, and with them, we kind of took the next scale of risk and said, if we start a federally regula regulated facility, we'll process all of your fish. And so that allowed us to start this processing plant to be able to have, to make this product uh, accessible to locals. But to, to be clear, it's not the local markets that, that, m that make this business. Probably 5% of our sales um, are to retail customers in Nova Scotia. It's a really important part of the philosophy of the business, but you certainly wouldn't be able to do what we've done if it was only, you know, able to happen on the million people population that we that we have here. So there's no provincial actually um, fish processing plant. So you immediately had to go federal. And we were we were lucky again in keeping this small. Um, there's a 2,000 square foot 
uh, seafood processing facility on Millbrook First Nation attached to their Arctic char plant that they weren't using anymore. Um, so we rented that and said, well, we're just going to figure it out um, and hired a consultant and then worked with Perenia, who's been amazing, um, to do our preventative control plans. And actually realized in, this, in the same way that you're... That, that you commented, that federal regulations, I think, have this sense that they're scary and that it's difficult to achieve a federal regulation. It's, it's actually easier in some ways because it's up to you as the operator to set the tone for what you're gonna do. And as long as you do what you say you're gonna do, then they're, then they're happy. And it's not, I don't think in the same way that the provincial regulations are quite black and white, um, I actually never found it to be, to be something that wasn't achievable. And you know, when you, you see mistakes, so you, know, you put a corrective action in place. You know, we had a mistake on our labels where we had a capital G instead of a little g, and we had like 10,000 labels. And it was like, well, what do you do? It's like, okay, we're gonna write a corrective action that next time we print labels, we're gonna make it a little g, and it's gonna take us six months to do that. But it was very clear, the, the, the process, and it's all you know, achievable. And I would say the, the biggest lesson for me um, which we often don't think about is taking that next step in a similar way that Northumberland Lamb has, is getting a little bit bigger sometimes helps solve some of these smaller issues because you're, you're able to access you know, things that you weren't before. I think there's, there's just a, a role to play for, for being able to, to be in that, in that space. And in seafood, you're certainly forced to be that way because there is no provincial regulation. Um, for us, it's more related to access. So in, in Nova Scotia, there's still a moratorium on being able to access fish buyers licenses and processing licenses for primary fish species. So we can't buy ground fish, halibut, haddock, um, lobster, snow crab directly from a boat because we don't have the license. And there's no clear pathway that they're ever going to change that. Um, so we've protected a system in Nova Scotia that the current seafood operators are, are who will continue to be the operators. I mean, before the license change happened, we added scallops to our license, so we can still um, do that. But on the other hand, we, we likely would never be in a position to buy directly ground fish um, because, again, the volumes are so high. Seafood processing equipment is so specialized and so expensive, um, we just, I don't see there being a way that that will be part of, of our business. Um, we will always buy from haddock, haddock processors and demand that they buy from who we want. It means you gotta show up on the days that they're processing that product. Um, and you do have to work with, with existing um, operators to get the type of, of product that you want, but it certainly does have to be a lot more co collaborative because there's no, there's no access. So we've actually, over the years, certainly started to work more and more with aquaculture producers. So Sustainable Blue, as I mentioned, they're, they're a land-based salmon farm. Um, there's a land-based uh, Arctic char farm in northern New Brunswick. Um, there's a land-based uh, trout farm in, in the valley as well. Um, and then oyster farmers. So we we purchase from a lot of oysters and mussel and mussel farms. And a much smaller percentage of our our sales comes from the wild seafood world because that regulatory piece is so is so difficult. And it's still a little bit the the wild west, I would say, in Nova Scotia in terms of the wild fishery and what happens. Um, and the aquaculturalists that 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 we work with have such a different philosophy about what they're what they're trying to do in their interactions with their environments that I actually find them to be much more professional relationships and they're much more collaborative um, and it's been a really good um, way to grow. Um, which brings me to to something that I think is is a really big challenge for Nova Scotia in terms of our protein production in the future. And I don't think it's something that we're very well aware of because seafood is our number one export. It is the most important part of our economy. Last year, seafood sales were $2.6 billion. Of that, 82 million came from aquaculture. Of that 82 million, 6 million came from shellfish aquaculture. So if you look at the, at the breakdown between wild fisheries and aquaculture, we're at like 3% in Nova Scotia. In the world, it's, 
it's more like 50-50, it's getting closer to 60-40. And what we need to be aware of as Nova Scotians is that we're in an incredibly precarious position with an over-reliance on the wild fishery. Um, and as we see sea level temperatures increase and we see a decrease in the lobster fishery in Maine, for example, we know that those are gonna to continue to move north. And are we prepared for a transition in the lobster fishery, which was a billion dollars last year to Nova Scotia's economy, if we haven't thought productively about aquaculture and shellfish aquaculture and seaweed aquaculture in our waters? We have an issue in Nova Scotia with social license. We have a lot of communities who are very opposed to the ocean being productive spaces for, for legitimate reasons, I think. I think there are you know, conversations that we have to have there, but I think we're at a tipping point in terms of protein production. Shellfish is one of the best protein sources we can, as humans, consume from a nutrition perspective and from a climate perspective, and we're not growing it in Nova Scotia. And that's the message I'd like to get out, is that if we compare New Brunswick and PEI, we are so underperforming in Nova Scotia. We are not thinking about shellfish farms. These can be a great place for young people to make, to make, living, make a living, and it's, and it's rather impossible in Nova Scotia. We've had one new aquaculture lease approved in the past nine years. Um, in Nova Scotia because of this problem with open net pen salmon farming. And we followed the same, we, we put shellfish farmers in the same bucket as, as uh, open net pen producers. And these are some of the largest companies in the world. We as small family farms cannot deal with that, with that level of regulation. I think us as a population need to think um, a lot more about how we can integrate aquaculture into our communities and, and in fact demand it because uh, this is a protein that I'm sure of in 500 years we will be consuming much more than we are than we are today and, and we need to be because of the climate um, impact that, that that particular species has. Thank you very much, Hannah. I love the diversity on this panel. I think we've covered so much rich material. We have a few minutes left, but before I go to questions and answers, I just want to address the food issue or, uh, that we're all going to be thinking about if our stomachs are rumbling. So they've actually, as you can see, set up food here in the Hudson Room. And there'll also be the one in, uh, that they used last night. So everybody here can just uh, regroup over there and get food. And they're asking those of us who are taking food from here to just go ahead and eat in the room out, outside. So it's pretty straightforward. And if you have a special diet, please just approach the chefs and ask, and they will meet that. So, administration out of the way. Let's move to any other questions and answers. Does anyone have any specific questions for Hannah? I see Josh. There we go. This is actually maybe a Hannah and Michael question. I'm just curious uh, for both of you as producers to maybe reflecting a little bit on the research that you did. Like, if you have some kind of success stories, how you navigated, particularly the relationships, I think, with the individual humans who you had to interact with as part of the inspection processes. Like, you found your way through things. Uh, what did you do to find your way through? Like, are there, th are there lessons that you've taken out of interacting with with the inspection regimes that you've had to navigate? I think in some ways by having your own plan and sticking to it and being a reliable operator yourself, um, the federal regulations, we, f seafood is low risk actually. Um, so whenever you self-identify, they put you in like the order of when you're gonna be inspected. We, we haven't had an inspection in two years. So we do our regular micro testing every six months we do our water testing we do like if anybody comes in we have all the paperwork and we've said we're good operators and this is what we but it's actually operationally once you become federal and once you have the infrastructure in place i think in some ways that it's a little bit easier than the provincial regulations because i do think that i've heard of stories of inspectors coming in and saying you know i could shut you down tomorrow and it's I just don't see that ever happening really with federal inspectors. It's a much different relationship because they're like, well, I'm just gonna see what you're doing. Um, and they actually can't shut you down from one day to the next. You have, like there's a protocol of, okay, this mistake happened, here's where we're gonna fix it. There's, you know, it's a much, much different relationship um, 
which is bizarre because we're the supplier, we're CFI inspected, we deliver to restaurants, and restaurants go through way more than than we do, to be honest. Well, it's a little bit different in meat inspection because we have an inspector all the time uh, that you're... Yeah, we don't kill animals, so that's different. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we, yeah, we do have an inspector there every day, you know, when you're, when you're there, and they can be there at all time. But, and they could stop production. They can't shut, I mean, they can't shut you down unless, you, the only way you would get shut down is if you refuse to, to follow a corrective action. You refuse to do what you have to do. If you if you follow the procedures, they don't they they won't shut you down. But they can stop you from operating on a day until you fix something. You know, like if they come in and says, "What's going on here? This is you can't operate. There's condensation or something. This has to be fixed first. But outside of that, it I I mean it's you know where you stand and and you know if you're doing it right and you've got all the paperwork. You know and you're following and, and, and unless you stop doing it you should be okay. I mean, th they could identify a problem that slipped through, but it's not an issue, and it's usually good for you to find out. And we don't have troubles with the, if the, inspe if the inspector says, this is not okay, I mean, we just fix it. We don't argue with them. You know, you don't say, what do you mean? You know, if you start arguing with them, yeah, you're gonna have trouble, but we don't. I mean, it basically, and it usually, it's a very good relationship, it's reasonable. He has his, he has to follow his, uh, he's got people over him that tell him exactly all his different things he has to do, check on us when and how often, and we have to do what we said we were gonna do. So it's, it's, it's a lot better, you know, the operating of it, I, I think is good, but it's difficult to get there. I wouldn't gloss over that. I, I mean, you, you, that takes a little bit of, it's more, you know, it, it's, it's maybe more scary than it, than it really ends up being. It just sounds really difficult, but than it is, and it is, you know, it is difficult, but just gotta persevere. The other important thing that I did mention was um, perennia. So they, we have a seafood accelerator, so we get 50 cent dollars on, they're, they're amazing. Like how would I know as a person who's an entrepreneur, the like ins and out of the, fish inspection regulations like there's no way so being able to outsource that expertise to help you design your sops is, is super invaluable because you should not try to teach yourself that as the entrepreneur i, I yeah i agree 100 percent. perinia was a huge i mean we could not have done it without perinia for sure thank you uh another question in the back there don't know where the mic is. Yeah, so th this was really interesting because a fish and, and meat are different. Uh, they have, it's, it's, even the programs are, they have a bit of a different philosophy, but one thing that you guys spoke about and I found it was in common when you, Hannah, were talking about the leases and how these big multinational that do the salmon farming and somebody who is gonna have a little lease for, sea, for shellfish it's have to, pretty much going through the same bureaucracy. And I'm curious about how many of those 60 something uh, meat processors that wanted to go in the pilot actually ended up getting, you see? And you had to bend over backwards to fit into the system, but the system, the pilot was designed in such way that the system was not made to try to fit you. And the point I'm trying to make is that a lot of these regulations are designed in a way that favor larger scales. And then, the, then it's, it's kind of the dominant mindset when they were desi designed. And if we really want this smaller scale to be able to access uh, this, this ability to, in the, in the case of meat, to be federally registered, in the case of fish, to be able to access some markets that you need to be registered, or then we somehow have to find the political will 
to change that mindset or to influence, and that's why I found so interesting your presentation, Shelley, on the on the um, on the university procurement, because I think that we all should be doing that. What you guys were doing, you just found you identified the barriers, and it was institutional, and it didn't make sense, and you went straight to the institutional barrier, and got and tried to find the leverage to change it. And I, I think that's a lesson that was learned. And uh, this was extremely interesting. I'm so glad that you guys were successful, but it shouldn't be so hard. Thank you One very much. out of 67. <laughs> so to me, that's a comment and not so much a question, and we've run out of time. So if anyone on the panel wants to actually make any final comments, feel free. But thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I would like to make one final comment about what she, she was saying there. One of the reasons why we were able to be successful, because Nova Sco fresh Nova Scotia lamb, and much like fish too, I mean, it, people expect to pay more for, for fresh local lamb. We can't compete against New Zealand and Australia price-wise, or we have no, no sheep farmers at all. So we have to be able to price it, and the, like Sobeys is willing to pay the price we, we have to have. We can't expand endlessly, you know, because uh, the customers, the consumer, will, will only pay so much. But it is true, without that higher price, the, all these regulations that came in about identifying every animal, uh, although this makes it easy for doing uh, recalls and that, it's onerous, it's expense for little producers way more than it is for big producers. Actually, these things help the big producers. Like, if you're doing millions of animals a day of beef, these extra tagging costs is nothing, you know, per, it's, but for small little producers, it's, it's dollars for every, for every animal, so it adds up, and then you have to be able to get that price, that extra price back. Thank you very much, Michael. So everyone, please uh, join me in thanking Hannah, Michael, and Karen today. <laughs> <laughs>